my king, Bobby Cannavale, plays yes. Joe DiMaggio. And I think the greatest crime that has ever been done to cinema <laughs> is hot people constantly playing Joe DiMaggio. Have you seen that man's face? He has a memory. He looks like Mr. Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Keep It, cricket media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III. I'm a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel. I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. Let's get into it. And we are back with an all new episode of Keep It. I am Ira Madison III. I'm Louis Fertel. This is unusual for me. I'm three quarters of the way through my iced coffee this morning already, which means I will be zippy today. <laughs> Usually I'm only about a couple sips in, but uh, I don't know what happened. What got into me? Do you know what I feel like? A try guy? <laughs> I don't. I've actually never once felt like that. Um, a friend sent to me a list of titles. I'm going to read them to you and you guess what they are. Okay. Okay. Ka-ching! Exclamation point. Thank you, baby! Exclamation point. Waiter! Exclamation point. Bring me water! Exclamation point. And what a way to want to be! Exclamation point. What are those? Loretta Lynn songs. Uh, may she rest. They are not Loretta Lynn songs, but you're actually on the right track. They are literally sequential songs from Shania Twain's Up album. <laughs> Is that the year she was introduced to Red Bull or something? What is going on? <laughs> I um, I don't know why I did not remember those titles, but um, waiter, bring me some water. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good Billy on the Street game. Shania Twain's song title or 1930s comedy routine. Is it? <laughs> the first half of the album is It's Fine. You know, she's not just a pretty face. I'm going to get you good. But then once we get to like um, all the songs with exclamation points, um, I'm not in the mood, parentheses, to say no. <laughs> <laughs> the rowdiness is so funny. She's truly broader than Reba, honestly. Reba has the reputation for the wackiness, but Shania is simply flying off the hook every song. Well, you know, and her new song, Waking Up Dreaming, is out. And that's all you have to say about that? <laughs> I, I like it <laughs> okay you do yeah. yeah i'm ready for the shania songs right but i apparently when she was in vegas she was fantastic everybody i know who went mind you everybody i know who went is also a devoted stan and they can't be trusted as you know so i'll have to go investigate yeah. for myself at some point that is fair anyway we've got such a week i want to say that i feel like so much has happened since we last recorded. Oh, God, no. Absolutely too much. The Try Guy fiasco for one. Yeah, which, by um, the way, you, I had no idea how invested people were in the Try Guys, let alone one of them having an extramarital affair. Honey, I can't name these people. I know the gay <laughs> one from seeing him in L.A. Eugene seems nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, people were very shocked how many people were invested on Twitter, and obviously the Try Guys have fans um, and their own brand. Um, it's very popular. But also... Most of Twitter used to work at BuzzFeed from 2014 and 2017. Well, they certainly brought it the fuck up this week. My God, was I sick of that. They're like, oof, you worked at BuzzFeed in 2015. The things you saw, the things you saw, you saw like Channing Tatum hanging out with puppies. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> you saw Josh Duhamel wandering through our desks looking for coffee. <laughs> Yeah, people treat it like it was like SNL in the 70s. You know, like, yeah, Paul Simon would just be walking through with Carrie Fisher on his arm or whatever. It was random um, working there. And there were, there are differences between, like, I have no idea what went on, like, the New York offices because I was in L.A. But, yeah, I feel like the, the revisionist history of, like, how insane it was is um, a bit much. It was mostly just, like, a bunch of kids doing their jobs underpaid while celebrities walk through. I just imagine there's like, you know, a whiteboard with a, a bunch of like a line graph on it going up. Like here's where the, the viewers need to go. Here's, we need this many eyeballs. So you better nail that list of the 25 times Jenna Dewan Tatum worked it or whatever. <laughs> uh, I read a lot of BuzzFeed at the time. I don't mean to denigrate everything they put out, but. 
<laughs> I don't know. When I think about the fact that I used to write like four articles a day for BuzzFeed, quote unquote articles, mostly lists and other things, but it's like coming in in the morning and having um, glitter ops meetings. Glitter ops was the name of my team. Help um, me God. <laughs> And they uh, investigated Mariah in 2001, you'll remember. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you're just coming up with, like, what you were going to write about. And someday you come in and you're like, girl, I don't know. Yeah, I'm Let done. Let me redo something that someone already did. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to steal 25 tweets about, you know, what exactly? Who was popular at the time? Um, you know. Tanache? 25, yeah, 25 thirsty tweets about Eddie Redmayne. I don't know. Uh, well, that's disgusting. <laughs> those people all went to jail. They're uh, not with us now. I do wish I could delete a lot of those BuzzFeed things, though, because I did once upon a time make a post about how I found Macklemore attractive. Whoa, you can't take it back. Well, look, I can't take I, it back. Here's what I did brilliantly. For years, I blogged for sites that all now don't exist. So you can't find any of that shit now. And at the time, I considered that a detriment to my career. Like, oh, I can't go back and, you know, use these clips I spent all my time on. But ultimately, I saved myself the embarrassment of having to explain why I made a slideshow about, you know, the 20 times Gwen Stefani fell on her face or whatever exploitative thing I wrote. I know. Like, you cannot find this old article that you wrote once about Kevin James being the new Chris Farley. <laughs> did I do that? You sure did. <laughs> but oh, when man. I look at there... the Wayback Machine, like that uh, article is not saved on the archive. So uh, wow, yeah, it's gone. Mm-hmm. That's a uh, that was that was when I was I was hungry for hits at MovieLine dot com. I would say is blank the new blank, except it would be a completely <laughs> offensive idea. So people would just get into the comments and shriek and you know throw a knife and all that. Well, we're about to find out if um, Billy Eichner is the new. Woody Allen? I don't know. I the thought came to my mind only in good ways. I'm I'm not comparing. Oh no, no the, <laughs> the, the 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 nice Woody Allen. Um, yes. he he has no Billy to our knowledge has no stepchild that he wants to marry. No, to, to our knowledge, that's right. Yeah, he had he's not even people. married. So. Right. See, it makes it easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Luke McFarlane was appropriately aged in Bros. Right. No, I mean, it's kind of the rare rom-com about people in their 40s. How many movies like that exist? Period. You know? Yeah. Just, um, I mean, most Judd Apatow movies. Kind of. I get, all right. So Judd Apatow now has this sort of uh, collection of films. Yes. They're all 40-year-old a, a version. And that, that one movie about the marriage that I didn't like. This is 40? Or yes, this is, this is 40. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. A lot of 40s in his movies. Wow. Yeah. A series. Maybe this have. movie should have been called Gay 40. Mm. Now, uh, f- uh, 40 gay days, 40 gay de- nights. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, wor- I don't work in ad copy. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are going to get into bros. We're going to get into all of this week's hot releases, actually. Bros. Blonde. Which Hocus watched, Pocus yes. 2. Yes, I also watched that. Yeah. So this is a real uh, Siskel and Ebert episode. Wow, it should get spicy and I'll <laughs> we, we can get into a fight where we swig Guinness at a local <laughs> Chicago diner or something. Ira and Lewis at the movies. You're telling me we can't sell that in the room? Guys, all we're gonna do is watch these movies anyway. It's easier if you just give us this show. Well, we tried to sell a keep it show in the room and we saw how that worked. Woof. <laughs> Guys, you should have seen us. <laughs> <laughs> Unprofessional. Yeah. Three years of hitting the pavement in Tinseltown. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, the narrator from LA Confidential or whatever the fuck that was. Also, in addition to this conversation about the movies that are out now, we are joined by the iconic, elegant, um, fantastic. I have so many adjectives for her. Uh, Regal, Isabella Rossellini. All right, we will be right back with more Keep It. It was another big weekend for movies, but actually only if you're the horror movie Smile. Right, which people apparently love. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet either um, because I promised um, my friend Drew that I would see it with him, and I have not been back in town to see it with him uh, because I'm a liar. But um, that movie's budget has been immense. Smile's been everywhere. 
And I want to say that the creepy marketing campaign of people like standing up doing the creepy spell at baseball games, surprised those people did not get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clever marketing campaign, though. <laughs> we have three movies that we're going to talk about this week. Um, first of them, bros, let's get into it. The movie did Which, not do well at the box office. Yes, it made something like $4.8 million or something. And obviously, it's a for a rom-com in general, it has a pretty big budget. Uh, but at the same time, I don't mean to say this to throw shade at anybody who made the movie, but I'm also not surprised because, one, I just think it's rare that a rom-com would do well, period. Especially alone, in October. Yeah, the October placement is a little bit strange. Yes, we're, this is Blanchette season. You need to not get in the way of that. <laughs> the um, girls are waiting for Tar, okay? Yeah, right. Oh, by the way, I have the, my ticket for that. That will be coming up next week. <laughs> see, see you at AMC on Thursday, of the day before it comes out officially. Um, uh, but also, I don't know, like, like, for instance, Trainwreck, which is the movie I still would most compare bros to. Mm. By the time that came out, I mean... Everybody definitely knew who Amy Schumer was. It would have been crazy if you had not seen either an Amy Schumer special or uh, Inside Amy Schumer, which, by the way, I'm very thrilled is coming back. I fucking love that show. I'm psyched for that. I just started watching that for the first time, by the way, because uh, my friend Paul McCallion was like, it's really funny. And oh, yeah. I had only seen sketches here and there, and it's kind of great. And I feel like we're now in this era of reevaluating Amy. Yeah. No, it, for for a sketch show, it had a, a really strong point of view and a necessary one in that genre. But um, yeah, like Billy obviously has had multiple uh, TV triumphs over the years, namely um, Billy on the Street, a show he created where he screams at people on the street. I, of course, wrote for that. Full disclosure, I'm a friend of Billy's, so know that going forward in this conversation. But... I still think, like, t- for him to vault from that and, like, American Horror Story appearances to marquee star, like, I could see that being uh, a lot of audience members still not knowing who he is or not knowing he can act like that. And, by the way, mm-hmm. I do think this is his best acting performance today, too. He's very good in the film. And yeah. I would agree with that, too, mostly because when Amy Schumer did Train Rat, comparing it to that, you know, like... She was doing stand-up. Like, she was sort of yeah. everywhere, too. You know? Like, whether it was controversial or not. You know? And I th- still think that Billy on the Street is somewhat niche. And his biggest grossing film, um, he played a meerkat. That's right. He t- <laughs> I, I knew what it was the minute you said it. Yes. <laughs> I, in fact, it's like one of the highest grossing movies of all time, right? Yeah. Right. He did get to stand next to Beyonce, which, you know, not everybody gets. Uh, no. and, and is close friends with Mariah Carey. So we love that, you know. But um, I think, like, the sitcom Difficult People is maybe even too far removed from the release of this film. And I know it took Billy a long time to get this movie made as well. Right. Um, but it's interesting, the conversation around, you know, this versus gay film streaming, you know, with the Fire Island stuff earlier this summer. And it's almost like, I feel like the film will find an audience, but on streaming, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I've seen a lot of people come up with what I'll, what I'll call glib arguments for why the movie didn't do well. And, and, and then there's defense glib people who online. Are, I know it seems crazy. And in a tweet, <laughs> yeah. Um, but people are like, well, you can't blame x and x because we, we have things like rupaul's drag race like moonlight was a hit you know about uh, regarding people going to see things that are gay related first of all if we're going to talk about rupaul's drag race it took forever for that show to become a phenomenon like for mm-hmm. instance and like and like nominated for emmys etc you know it was something you watched on cable with your gay friends before and it, it didn't hold the national conversation and it, it wasn't like mandatory viewing for gay people until many years in um and also, I don't know, dramas, like when people bring up Brokeback Mountain, it's like, I think people are more comfortable watching gay people gay drama. in peril than watching gay people having a good time. Like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's homework they want to do if it's gay people mm-hmm. in trouble. And if it's gay people just living their lives, they're like, well, I don't have to see that. I live my own life, you know? You also can't compare a film like this to a drama that's in awards contention. And yeah. people are being mm-hmm. told, like, it's great, you know? And also, Moonlight had... Like, 
multiple different demographics wanted to see it. You know, it was a queer film, you know, but also it was like a black film, you know, and it was an awards film, you know. So, like, mm-hmm. this has the gay stuff going for it. I will actually say that a large part of the problem is, you know, the marketing. I mean, listen, we know these Judd Apatow films. We know, like, 40-year-old version, Knocked Up, like, Bridesmaids, you know. Like, the thing those movies do well is, one, not be released in October when it's, like, award <laughs> season. And horror movie season, there's a reason Smile beat it, you know. Uh, it's a cheaply made horror movie, and everyone's going to go see a horror movie um, opening weekend. But also, like, the trailer. I think if you remember from the trailer, like, you know, the, like, straight people had a good run joke. You know, mm-hmm. I think that like for a movie like that, you need like the one like big sort of raunchy joke that is in the trailer that is everywhere. You know, yeah. everyone knows like the one joke from like every comedy they love that because it was in the trailer and it's Correct. everywhere, you know, and I think that the trailers didn't really do the work of it. I think that the poster unfortunately doesn't do the work of it the poster doesn't tell you what the movie is no and also it it, it, i feel like the the poster which is two guys from behind with hands on each other's butt it sort of looks like the the born in the usa album cover or something yeah it it doesn't get to the spirit of the film which is one like somewhat acidic humor there's whimsical romance in it this feels to me a little bit more coded like i don't know what you think you're going to see from that movie but it's not what you actually get in I film. wish I'd seen Bruce Springsteen in a movie. That would have been cute. <laughs> um, but you're, but like a movie I keep thinking of in this regard is American Pie, which had mm. no stars, you know, in, in the leads anyway. You know, you might have heard of one of like I don't know someone like Tara Reid maybe before it came out, but you weren't seeing the movie for someone like her. And why that movie became a phenomenon, and it's like it really assured audiences you are getting this raunchy good time. You mm-hmm. know, you're you're going to be gagged by some of the. The, the visuals in this by what the characters say, et cetera. And, and what fucking you got a pie. The, yeah, fucking a pie. Right. Have you seen that in a movie before? No. Um, whereas in the bros trailer, I think it went, it was almost a bit unassuming. You know, mm-hmm. like you don't really have to see this. Here are a few jokes that are lightly at straight people's expense, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, unfortunately, like I go to the I go to the movies for entertainment, you know? And I'm never going to be swayed by, like, I need to see this film for gay activism, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. which is how it was marketed a bit. And it's mostly because we've been tricked into this thing by movie studios that, like, we have to show up for everything. If it's a black film, you have to show up for it. If it's a gay film, you have to show up for it because there's that dangling carrot of, are you ever going to get another one, you know? And I think that, Mm -hmm. like, those films still have to offer the audience something else in the marketing. And I think that unfortunately, like the past few weeks, like leading up to it, a lot of it became, you know, like we need to see this to support gay mainstream films, you know, which I want to see it because it's raunchy because it's funny, you know? And there's something I think, unfortunately about that kind of marketing where you're emphasizing, Oh, it's the first of its kind in this way, this way, and this way, where it almost seems like you're getting away from, well, this is something you'll really like, you know, Mm -hmm. you're, you're you're treating it like homework as opposed to, um, you know, just something you have to see, you know, I think if if there's a vibe about a movie that makes it seem really funny, you know, I think people galvanize pretty quickly. Um, I I mean, I think there are also like myriad other reasons why it didn't work again. Like Billy is, is, a kind of a new idea for a marquee start. Like we, we brought up Woody Allen before, Mm -hmm. but Woody Allen took a few years before people were like, Oh, I trust this person to go see movies with him. And he played like the same personality again and again. So people kind of came to know what to expect by the time Annie Hall was a phenomenon, for example. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, like, it's not like what's up tiger Lily, you know, made a lot of money. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You know, um, yeah, you you sort of have to work up to that moment. Um, and, you know, we both love Billy. And, you know, this isn't obviously the end of his career. So um, I'm excited for it. And, you know, it's one of his first, it's his first film, you know? And, and just, uh, by the way, the jokes in it are fucking hilarious. I mean, the, I, I constantly am missing from pop culture. I, I feel routinely shamed for wanting to make... Um, jokes that are pop culture references or whatever. I think there are a lot of people mm-hmm. who think that's a workaround or they'll become dated quickly or something. Meanwhile, 
everybody who listens to this show will know this. I literally think in terms of pop culture. If something mm-hmm. happens to me that is unusual in my life, I'm comparing it to a movie I saw or whatever, a, a celebrity who said something at one point. And I find a lot of, I think celebrities and pop culture are a great way to communicate with each other. So, mm-hmm. and I don't, I, 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 I personally find that to There's be nothing but a to joy. There's art too, Yes, you know? right. Like you can't mm-hmm. just say, um, you know, like um, a quote from Anchorman and call it a day. You know, there's, no, there's a different right. art to referencing pop culture, like in a show like 30 Rock or something where, um, you know, we um, you have to sort of know your audience and you have to know the reference and you have to be commenting on it as well. You know, it's not just sitting around with the straight kids in middle school, like hearing them um, quote Seinfeld reruns back to you. Right, right, right. There's right. something more. Yeah. There, right, exactly. It's it's that you've processed pop culture as if it's a mutual friend you guys all have, and we're going to talk about it that way. Um, anyway, this movie does that brilliantly. It's my favorite thing about the movie. And if you haven't seen it yet, I, I mean, I would be blown away if you didn't like the movie. It's that good. So yeah, uh, I think Guy Branum is fantastic in it. Oh yeah, um, and, uh, another another person. Obviously, he's co-hosted uh, our own podcast several times. Um, one of a kind person. I mean, I, again, I, I think I posted about this on my Instagram the other day, but. It's rare that there's a gay comic who might be better at trivia than I am, and I have nothing but reference for him. Like, I don't want to kill Guy Branham. But anyway, yeah, I thought, the mo- I thought the movie was fun. I will say, one note is, um, not to bring up one of my favorite Douglas Sirk quotes, uh, uh-huh. but people would always ask him, you know, like, what his movie's about, and were they commenting on things, were they real with something, you know, like, he has this great interview where he's just sort of like, you know, no, because I feel like the moment like you start to make a movie about something is sort of when you failed. And I don't I'm not saying that this is a failure, um, because I enjoyed the movie, but I will say my least favorite parts of the movie were where it felt like we were teaching LGBTQ history. Sure. Yeah. You know, because I feel like I I feel like the movie, by being like a raunchy, funny gay film on its own, is the activism and the lesson in and of itself. You know, Billy's character is the lesson in and of itself, you know? So even though all those fucking people are funny, Harry Neff, you know, Miss Lawrence from Real Housewives, you know, um, T.S. Madison, you know, like yes. they're all fucking funny people, you know? Uh, I wish moments I were wishing they were just like funny and going back and forth with each other instead of talking about, you know, LGBTQ culture. I still recoil right. whenever I hear the phrase cis white male <laughs> on screen. Like, yeah. like even like saying it as a joke now, it just feels like it's so been taken over by like people on the internet talking it's fraud. about. Cl- yeah. yeah uh-huh. It's fraud, you know? And I have to imagine like if it makes us recoil, it has to make like straight and non-queer people recoil too. Yes. You know what I would compare that to? Um uh, and pardon me, people who don't want me to say this name ever again. When Madonna, when Madonna made Ray of Light, <laughs> something changed. We're gonna start a Madonna ticker. Yeah, right. <laughs> we need a buzzer or something. Yeah, like I'm uh, zapped. Yeah, right over here. Um, but when she made Ray of Light, which of course was a, a critical success, something changed in her. It's like she thought she stopped thinking that she herself was the message, and that she had to have another message to deliver. And that's when the lyrics became a bit pretentious. And that's when the lyrics became a bit nonsensical, if you're asking me. Miss mm. Kabbalah? Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that era. Miss Bracelet? Yeah, Miss <laughs> Bracelet. Woof. Remember Britney <laughs> in the Every Time video? Moving on. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's like, no, like, for certain people, them existing and, you know, conveying that life, however they can, is still revelatory. You know, who, who el- who's the other Billy Eichner in movies? You know, it just, mm-hmm. it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, wow. Which was more annoying during that era? Livestrong bracelets or Kabbalah bracelets? Ooh. Well, I would say that, well, Livestrong bracelets did not give luxury to me. Mm. Whereas if you had a Kabbalah bracelet, I know you've been to a couple meetings and I think mm-hmm. Stella McCartney was at one of them. They gave cheap. They gave... Working class, um, yes. even though it was mostly just rich white kids at my high school who had them. Um, but it was more of a bro athlete thing. Um, right. and, yeah. and, and the liar thing, yes. <laughs> you brought up Madonna. 
uh, and now I have to say that I just rewatched this 84 um, interview that she gave, you know, on uh, music. She's like on a panel with um, James Brown and um, Oh, with um, John um, Oates. Oates. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. it's one of the best and interviews I had, ever. I yeah. had never seen it before. I was talking to my friend Lucas Tim about it, uh, who's like a huge Madonna um, stan. Um, and it is just, you know me, I love Hall and Oates. Like, I've got my Hall and Oates tattoo. But like, seeing oats in 84 being like um you know i got in this industry to be a musician and people who got into this industry to be a musician they don't want to also be an actor you know and yeah he's um, railing against the existence of music videos as a way to sell artists primarily yeah yeah because this is like 84 and like the whole like most most of the conversation is like music videos should artists have to do them and madonna's like I think it's a great way to reach people who can't go and see your concerts. And she's like, when you're performing on stage, like it's the same thing as acting, you know, when, you know, if you just put a camera on them, it's the same thing. And then like when he went over his tirade, uh, she turns to him, she says, you're acting now. Which is the <laughs> own of owns. He is spelt. He, he has to stop speaking at that moment. And she like gives that like signature bastardly uh, snicker afterwards. She's like, you're acting now. Like I that. like, <laughs> I like the eighty four. So I like the eighty four interviews of her because she's like she's sure of herself, but she's also still deferential to icons in the music industry a bit. Like she snapped at him because they're arguing, but like when she talks about other people, like James Brown and people being on the panel and George Clinton, she's like speaking as like you know like I'm grateful to be here, you know. And it's interesting right. to see Madonna in that era. Of like, I'm grateful to be here, yeah, and and also like, yeah, I know Debbie Harry preceded me five minutes ago. You yeah, know? like yeah, aware of where she exists on the timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, last side note: Did you read that great interview with um? Did you read that great interview with um Karen um O in Vulture? I did not, and she uh, the yeah yeah yes were just on Kimmel too, so I didn't. Uh, it was really good, and like I think uh. Alex Young asked her a question about like um, a random moment she had gotten like advice from Debbie Harry, uh, and she was like, <laughs> she still didn't like really get it um, because it's um, in Lizzie Goodman's book Meet Me in the Bathroom. There's a story about how she, um, Karen approached Debbie Harry for advice on how to navigate being a girl in a boy's world, and she told her just enjoy it while it lasts, and her response was ambivalent. And uh, Karen, I was like. Um, she feels bad about that incident because she was wasted then. Like she tapped Debbie on the shoulder and like she's probably just doing trying to enjoy herself. And this young sloppy girl comes up to this badass and she's like, but the advice wasn't very helpful at the time. Um and she says, But maybe that's something I would say ten years from now. <laughs> but I love that like Karen O taps Debbie Harry on the shoulder. It's like, how do I be like a girl in a boy's world? She's like, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> wow, <laughs> haunting. Giving uh, a Winona Ryder in Black Swan. Yeah. Uh, okay, so all right. The other polarizing movie this weekend was Blonde. And let me tell you, this movie is trash. Well, Blonde, <laughs> first of all, is Blong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was two hours it 40. Is, fuck, is, is so David Lean long. behind the camera? What the fuck? I was like, listen, baby. Maryland of Arabia, motherfucker? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, let's talk about the assassination of Marilyn Monroe by the coward Andrew Dominic. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, it's such a man's idea of, quote, unquote, adding dimension to a woman's life. Because truly, this movie is one of the most led in movies in recent memory to me. And secondly, painting someone as a perpetual, I'm not going to say victim. I'm going to use a different made up word, which is suffery. <laughs> does not mean you think of them as a human being. It and I'm, means... we're not talking about voters, okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is not about Emmeline Pankhurst and Susan B. Anthony. No. Yes. She, I love Anna de Armas. I thought she was Zap. great. I thought she was actually great in this movie, honestly. Yeah. I think she's good too, but there is something about how she has to portray basically a baby the entire film. Yeah. She's she's a woman who like I there's rarely any scenes where she is taking action 
of her own volition is constantly just men bouncing her back and forth. And the idea, like, it's not novel, the idea that, like, you know, like, there was a conflict between who Norma Jean was and Marilyn Monroe was. But, like, the idea that she absolutely hated seeing herself on screen and being in films is like, well, bitch, why are you an actress? <laughs> you know, I'm like, confused. Let's, 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 let's examine that, you yeah. know? No, um, no, you're right. There's not a mo- moment in this movie where she does anything that reveals a, a real character. It's like she suffers through some indignity or worse, you know, some human rights violation, basically. And then uh, she sort of like nervously giggles at what's happening or eventually bursts into tears. But that's it. It's like it's a, like a movie scolding everybody who was around her her entire life. And that's it. It's a little don't worry, darling, to be honest. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. a little like I was thinking of Rosemary's Baby. It's like it's one of those woman figuring things out films, except she never figures it out. No, she's just a, a, a tragedy from beginning to end. Yes. And I want to say one of the weirdest things is the relationship that's concocted um between Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr. Um, and she's allegedly did date Charles Chaplin. Chaplin Jr. Uh, and maybe was involved with Edward G. Robinson for like a hot second. But like, there's like this whole threesome like that's built up between these three. And like, it's also the insinuation that like Charles Chaplin and Edward G. Robinson like are a couple too. But I'm like, this is where I'm talking about like her being bounced back and forth from men to men. And like this, like this man's idea of a woman, like even the depiction of her in a threesome with two men and two men who seem to be in a relationship with each other as well is devoid of anything sexy. And like Charles and um, Edward in the film, like they never even kiss one another while having sex with her. They never fuck one another. It's just sort of like you're presenting a gay couple who was dating Marilyn Monroe on screen and they are devoid of sexuality too. It's just very weird. Also, the way they act towards her is, like, gross. They're, like, leering, and, like, they just feel like a bunch of hands that are constantly all over her. The sex is, like, really icky. Honestly, do you know what I would kind of compare this movie to? I mean, it reminds me of Repulsion. Right. Oh, we can go into that movie sometime. The scenes where Catherine did is just, like, the hands coming at her from the hallway. Right. Um, God, we talked about Polanski and Woody Allen in this episode. (laughs) We win. Yeah. Um, No, honestly... A movie I would kind of compare it to, and I know people love this movie, but similar problem to me is Spencer, where they Mm. think they're adding dimension to this this uh, the beloved icon's life, but really all they're doing is making all the people around her seem like flat villains, and then turning into like some sort of opera. Her quote unquote inner struggle, even though her inner struggle is just crying. So I wanted to ask you about that too, because like I was talking with um. My friend um, Juan Ramirez is like a reporter from the New York Times who likes this film for some reason. Um, <laughs> but his, but he did ask like, why didn't people have some of the same complaints about Spencer um, as they do about Blonde? Because he felt Spencer does the same thing. Yes, no, and I agree. And also, well, first of all, it's a briefer film, mercifully. Um, and then <laughs> Spencer's second, like a commercial, to be honest, yes, compared to this yeah. film. But also, like, I feel like Spencer more artfully gets into the surreal than this movie does. Like, any Mm. sort of surreal Kafka-esque touches in this movie are just to say, well, here comes another disgusting thing she went through. You know, guess how JFK treated her. Like, that's it. True. And I would say that, like, even if you don't like Spencer, like, Pablo Lorraine, like, I think you think he's a good director. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not asking interesting questions about the women he makes movies about, but I do think he's talented, yes. <laughs> um, and I will also say that, like, you know, like that, you know, by nature of us sort of knowing more about Diana, um, she at least she at least has a purpose in that, like something she wants to do. Yes, right. Yeah. She wants Ma- to get out of that fucking house. Yeah, Marilyn you know? is just haplessly, like, walking away from a horrible childhood. And by the way, I want to give Julia Nicholson some props. She's given a, a mm. thanklessly wretched mother character and does amazing with it. Yeah. I mean, the whole film is people like with wretched characters like doing, putting in work. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of wretched characters, um, my king, Bobby Cannavale, plays yes. Joe DiMaggio. 
And I think the greatest crime that has ever been done to cinema is hot people constantly playing Joe DiMaggio. Have you seen that man's face? He has a memory. He looks like Mr. Ed. Yeah. <laughs> he does have a wonderful nose, uh, but that's about it. I will say also Adrian Brody really good as Arthur Miller in this movie. He is. And you know what? I will allow Adrian Brody playing Arthur Miller because Adrian Brody is alien looking. Um, and also, I think playwrights deserve to be represented by hot people on screen. No. Unless you're David Mamet. Correct. That's progress. Unless, of course, you're, play- you're hot and playing David Mamet. Please don't do that. Um, uh, also, Adrian Brody, to me, I've always thought of him synonymously in my head with Get Ready. Do you know what Clue Master Detective is? The expanded version of the expanded version of the board game. Uh, with the with the new um, yes, Miss Peach drawings. and Madame Rose. He looks exactly like <laughs> Monsieur Brunette to me, and I want him to play that in a Clue Master Detective <laughs> silver screen adaptation. Please do it, Adrian Brody. Call it Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess they're working on it. Never mind. Throw all these people in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, or, a, I don't know. A, stick him in a stick him in a Knives Out film. Yes. I mean, we kind of, he, he he had that air a little bit in Midnight in Paris, too, to bring up Woody Allen one more time. Uh, playing Salvador Dali, correct? Yeah. I mean, girl, I rewatched Manhattan this weekend, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl, luminous in that film. Yes. Because we were talking, uh, I was talking about, you know, Billy and like Woody Allen sort of like yeah. early days and how that's sort of like a model of like, who he could be, you know, because like, you know, um, and I, I think we should have more insufferable gay protagonists, to be honest. <laughs> uh, right. To totally. Get back, to get back to, to get back to bros, I think it actually wasn't navel gazy enough. Right. No, uh, he, the, we he like self monolo- indulgence. He has monologues in that movie where I'm like, Oh, you're speaking not for me, but this is the closest I've ever seen to like a lead character in a movie resembling a life that is like mine. And I'm not saying I need like, excess representation on the silver screen but to even hear a little bit of it pretty jarring anyway yeah um i will also say that what was the last thing about that uh last thing about bros again but like would you say he's more tom hanks or the meg ryan hmm i'm gonna say well i would say he's more billy crystal yeah more than billy crystal okay yeah, yeah. so that um w- with a little bit of a meg ryan um mm-hmm. don't fuck with me fellas vibe yeah, so I so I think like for his next film, I like the Luke, but I think for his next film, we he needs to be opposite a Meg Ryan. He needs mm. to be opposite a star that people know that is like, and they have like crackling sexy chemistry, but people are going to be like, I want to see those two together. Yeah, it would be interesting to see him. I think maybe dating a younger person too. I, I'm not saying, I, I thought Luke McFarlane was actually fabulous in this movie. Really enjoyed him. But like, whatever. Put Troy Sivan next to Billy Eichner. I want to see what happens. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, like we have a myriad of like younger uh, gay uh, That's true. actors yeah. now. You know, I would say um, Lucas Hedges. Right. Uh, by the way, what are we doing with Lucas Hedges right now? Last I saw Lucas, he was wearing boots out of Coyote Ugly out on the town with uh, Tommy t- Dorfman. T- t- Tommy Dorfman, yes. <laughs> I, there has not done anything since the premise that BJ Novak anthology on FX um, mm. and on screen was the last thing we saw Lucas in was um, Let Them All Talk. Jesus Christ! What the hell? This is a disaster. This is an Oscar-nominated you... actor. I hope she's shooting something. Yeah, and not just you know walking around town like Nancy Sinatra, <laughs> 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 which, which she did very elegantly. I don't mean to say she's uh, <laughs> Lucas can't do that. The last thing I want to say about this film is that um, my uh, <laughs> favorite tweet about it was. <laughs> When someone said that, like, Joyce Cole Oates was, like, basically too ugly to be writing about Marilyn Monroe. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that's why she was jealous of her. <laughs> also, apparently it has very little to do with the book itself. Like, the the filmmaker, say his name again? Andrew Dominic. Yes. He said, like, they use that as a Bible, but nothing in particular is taken from the book. So, I don't know what that means. Those feel like contradictory statements to me, but. <sighs> well... Anyway, Joyce is a mess too. So 
There you go. Um, blonde. That's what we think of it. Now, Hocus Pocus 2. Because we famously, on this podcast, don't like the original. No. And my problem with the original is it's mainly not about the three very Which, funny comic stars who are on the post. Yes, right. No, it's about these like kids, and they're super boring. The movie can't figure out what to do with itself. And there are a couple of good one-liners that Bette Midler gets. But this movie, this new movie, I just want to say, still doesn't really focus on the three witches enough. Like, it still is about these other people, and it's like, can we just have them hanging out, like, in an absolutely fabulous type environment where it's just about the three of these people? But Yeah, what's our practical magic with these yeah. three? Like, but, like mm-hmm. every time they're on screen together, it is amazing. Like, they're, but, they're, they have great chemistry. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you book them for this movie, telling them, well, you know, you're not the, the only stars. It won't be that much of a time commitment or something, whatever. But I want to say... Bette Midler, not skipping a beat. She was very funny throughout, which shouldn't surprise me. She obviously recently had a legendary run in Hello, Dolly. But it was really cool to see her still like giving those sideways glances, those really broad, comical moments that you associate with very old Bette Midler, as opposed to, and I'm not saying she was bad in the movie, but watching Sarah Jessica Parker in this movie, I would compare her doing this movie to when Amy Poehler came back to do Wet Hot American Summer 2, where Mm. you realize since she did that first project, the type of characters she played are totally different now. Like Amy Mm. Poehler used to be among the silliest people you would ever see in a project. You know, if you watch her on Conan O'Brien, she's playing like banshees who are screaming or like little kids, things like that. And as time went on, she became really adept and uh, prolific at playing mature characters, you know. Mm-hmm. And Sarah Jessica Parker, obviously a Sex in the City and, uh, and just like that. But also, like, you think of her as somebody who plays roles like divorce. Mm-hmm. And to, for her to harken back to that time in her career when she was this wild card person who would be in Ed Wood or Honeymoon in Vegas or L.A. Story was really fascinating because you, she truly would never play roles like that ever again. I know, but I miss that like square peg Sarah Jessica yeah. Parker. I miss, mm-hmm. you know, um, girls just want to have fun. Yeah. Bring girls her back. Wanna, yeah, right. I, I, I just say it's like sh- she would have no reason to revisit that. That's something she already did, you know. By the way, yeah. have I said this before? Do you know what Sarah Jessica Parker's first line in the movie Ed Wood is? No. If I'm not mistaken, Ed Wood is reading a review of his newest thing, which is a disaster, and... uh. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker plays an actress who's in it. And she looks at the review, and the first thing she says is, am I really a horse face? Can you believe all that we have fucking dragged this woman through? It's so fucking... Stu- like, that, is that supposed to be some, like, in-joke she has to be on, in on, and then I have to watch her say it? It's just, like, the ick of all time. Also, she's fucking gorgeous. You know what her first line in Mars Attacks is? Here we go. <laughs> what is it? No, I mean, this seriously. Oh, really? Go ahead. Oh, I thought this was about yeah. to be a gag. Go ahead. No, Glenn Close, like when the aliens are coming in, like Glenn Close is like, where is these um, aliens from? Jupiter? And she says, no, Mars attacks. <laughs> That's funny. It was a, it was a bit. <laughs> oh, damn it. I hate you. Yeah. No, Mars attacks. <laughs> then the, the title hits the screen. <laughs> uh, I would honestly love if like, like the, the Mars attack title, like a movie like that hits. I love when like a title hits the screen. After someone says the line. Yeah. And it's like, it's it's funny to me thinking about like a title hitting the screen like 45 minutes into a movie. Right. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of when uh, Vox Lux has the horrific first act where there's like a school shooting. And then we get the, the entire credits of the movie 15 minutes in. When people fuck with us like that, sometimes I'm like, you're pretentious. But also, that is kind of cool. Yeah. I, you know, I still haven't seen Columbine the musical. No, nope. but people tell me I would love Vox Lux. It's two exclamation points: Columbine, exclamation point, exclamation point. But yeah, oh <laughs> yeah, the characters unforgettable, indelible. No, so better than the first Hocus Pocus or not? Oh, I would say definitely yes. Um, it's better. Yeah, I mean, it's just more focused. It give it, it it zeroes in more on the thing you really wanted from the original Hocus Pocus. I just mm-hmm. continue to be baffled when people love that movie because it's not like clue where i do think people slightly overhype clue including myself it's like the movie i've definitely seen the most times there are definitely parts of that movie that don't work that are over long that aren't funny or they're too broad or whatever 
But Hocus Pocus, I I really I really struggled to understand what we were the, five. the good scene is. Yeah. We were like five. Yeah. Um and also that's a conversation for another day, like movies that we love that we've seen too much that are like there's scenes that don't work. I've found this in revisiting Heathers, which I fucking love. Mm-hmm. Um but some of the scenes are just like so long and like repetitive just a lot too. of talk. Yeah. Repetitive and it's like cut like twenty minutes from Heathers and it's a better movie. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Anyway, coming up, Isabella Rossellini joins us. Today we are delighted to be joined by actual royalty, an icon you know from such films as Death Becomes Her, Blue Velvet, and much more that we'll get to. Also, a farmer whose art often intersects with her deep love of animals, and her latest one-woman show, Darwin's Smile, opens in Los Angeles this weekend, and we are thrilled to welcome to keep it the elegant and delightful Isabella Rossellini. Oh, thank you so much. What an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but you hear your voice for even two seconds and you already live up to it. There's like, there's like the room changes when you start speaking. Do you get that feeling often? <laughs> Is it my accent? <laughs> I tried very much to erase it, but you can't. <laughs> I was unable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I feel like there's something about um, your quality, like the voice, just the way you speak, that just sort of like gives a bit of regal. And maybe it's the accent, but even even when you're doing comedy, I mean, I mentioned these iconic films, but, you know, I feel like um, I am constantly going back to your appearances on like 30 Rock, which is so wild to me. Um, you're just doing that later in your career. And... Um, and you work so much too, still. Like, um, do you still find joy from being on set uh, after doing it for so long? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally surprised. This year I turned 70, and I didn't think I was going to work at 70. Not because uh, one is tired, but just because there is less work. So it's true that for women, at least, there is less <laughs> work between 55 and 65, 50 and 65. My mama, that was also an actress, Ingrid Bergman, warned me, said, you know, there is a certain age where there is not much work because you are too old to be the love interest. Uh, Not that at 55 you don't have a a love interest, but it's not portrayed in films. And you are too young to portray the grandmother or the prime minister or whatever. And so I did experience that. And that's what made me become also a farmer because in the years I wasn't really working nor as a model, nor as an actress, I went back to university and took a master's degree on animal behavior and conservation and bought a farm. And and then job as an actress came back. So now I'm working a lot as an actress and as a farmer. Also, uh, it's interesting that this is a, a live show you're doing. Talk about your journey into doing just live performances. I mean, I think of you primarily as, uh, you know, movie actress and occasionally a TV actress. Yeah. Well, I started to write, uh, um, you know, in that period that I wasn't really working uh, and I was going to university, I found out uh, about animal and animal behavior. It was fascinating. And I first started with a a series of short film, comical film for Sandance Channel called uh, Green porn. Green porn. Yes, fabulous. Fabulous. And uh, they went viral. Uh, They were incredibly successful. And so then I made a second series, I tried, as they called it, Seduce Me, and another one about motherhood, and all this different way, because biodiversity exists. So you don't think that everything is a couple, male, female, having babies. Sometimes they are hermaphrodites, so each individual is a male or female. Sometimes they are animals that are called scientifically sequential hermaphrodites. They are born one sex, and they become another sex aging. So all these things I thought were so amusing because we might have uh, learned them in school, but they, I don't know, I didn't remember that maybe professor was very clear about it. So so I made a series, uh, comical, about uh, nature, and uh, that went viral. And then from that, uh, a friend of mine who's a a French actress called Carole Bouquet said, you got to make monologues using all these short short film that you have done because at the end I made about 50 short films and I did my first monologue and then I continue and this Darwin Smile is my third monologue and it, this one is based on expression of emotions and studies that have been done on animals and how they express emotion and expression of emotion is also the job of an actress isn't it 
So in this one, I talk about expression of emotion in animal and in humans, but also my experience as an actress and how do you reconstruct this emotion to fakingly portray them in films. So this one connects all my different interests. <laughs> I have to imagine, you know, um, with such varied interests like that too, um, you're you're a great person to like have a conversation with like over dinner. I mean, my, um, Jenny Slate was on our podcast recently and she discussed how she got you to be in um, Marcel, the show with the shoes on, yeah. and, you know, she, you at cooking like a dinner for her. And I'm just like, do you love just sort of like, what are conversation topics I feel like do you love to bring up with guests when you have over? Like, I assume like people will just love to hear more about animals in general. I mean, this this is fascinating to me. Well, a lot of people like animals, and a lot of people, uh, you know, they might uh, they might say, "My dog, uh, uh, you know, my dog is very attached to me. I, he tells me things," and then then they wouldn't recognize that other animal have intelligence, saying no. Only human beings have intelligence, although they might treat their dog uh, like a, a cognitive uh, being. So the science now has proven the animal is not only instinct. They are also degrees of different intel but of, of intelligence. And this is a new science and it's quite fascinating. Also, because if you think about it, we only have five senses as human being. And our sense, we perceive a certain range uh, of color, but animals might see in the ultraviolet color, they can hear better than us, and us. They can smell things we don't smell. So the world in front of their eyes or in front of their ears, because sometimes they don't have eyes, is completely different. They perceive the world completely different than we do. And that is also incredibly fascinating to me. I wish I could make a film about that. Wouldn't it be great talking about surrealism? That would be amazing. But still, the images haven't come to my mind. If they will, I will make that film. I will make that clip. It seems like a good topic to be fascinated with because you can never be done learning about it. You know, there's always some animal you don't know about. There's always some species I'm sure that's mind blowing. Do you find yourself still constantly reading up, constantly oh, getting new sure. information? Oh, yes, I, absolutely. Uh, I think that one of, I was not very good when I went to school when I was at the right age. I wasn't good at all. And, uh, but when I went back as an adult in my 50s, it's actually, it was wonderful because uh, it was pure curiosity. You know, there wasn't the pressure like you study, but now you have to get a job and you have to monetize your uh, knowledge. I just did it out of pure curiosity. And it was such a relief of all the pressure of the exam, the grades uh, and all that. So, uh, I, yes, I continue being very curious and uh, I find enormous joy in following my curiosity. You brought up um, surrealism a bit, you know, and the grid porno was uh, a bit of that as well. Um, where did you find that your love of sort of telling stories in that way came from? I mean, was it inspired, you know, by working, you know, with um, Lynch on like Blue Velvet and, you know, like Wild at Heart, or was it something that, you know, you learned um, early on sort of um, as an instinct? So probably being a raconteur, telling stories, probably something that I was born with. Mm -hmm. I also come from a family of raconteur. My fa my father was a, a film director. Absolutely. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and my mother was an actress. So telling story was part of my upbringing. And so probably I acquired from them or I acquired genetically, I don't know, or both genetically and culturally. So telling story and listening to story, uh, it's fun for me. Then when I started to direct my own short little film, I realized that my style was a little bit surreal and, and comical, um, which wasn't something that I had done a great deal of comical films. Uh, so it, it was my tone, it was my language. And I also thought, uh, ah, maybe that's why I got along so well with David Lynch and I understood him so well, because a lot of people say, we don't understand David Lynch's story, but I did. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, it's not the narrative's not important, you know, has, it, what happened to that person? Did he go to that appointment or didn't go? That doesn't matter, but there is a, a truth of the feeling that you feel inter interiorly, even the kind of confusion. I remember uh, David once defending himself from the accusation of, I can't understand your film. He said, but you enter into a room 
And immediately there is an atmosphere and you know immediately if you have to say, hello, how are you? To other people, you say, hey, hello, how are you? Why? That's what is interesting to me, that there is a, 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 that's a mystery, but yet there is an atmosphere that makes us behave. And that was what he tried to capture. And I, I was absolutely clear about that. So it wasn't so much the narrative, why were these people sitting in that room and what were they doing? But the aura that people have and the, 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 temp, you know, the mood that you constantly pick up. And uh, so that is very clear in his film. So anyway, my films as a director were quite surreal and comical. And, uh, and the surrealism of it, uh, I didn't expect. When I wrote it, I just wrote it trying to follow what I wanted to explain. And funny, you know, I think that when you make it funny, um, you also spend a lot of time making it funny for yourself because you have to find a joke. And, and so it's a very pleasurable uh, moment with yourself in front of a white piece of paper because <laughs> it's joyful. So I didn't want to dwell in the sadness. I wanted to dwell in fun. And that's how my film and all my work, including Darwin's Smile, is comical. Uh, I want to say something about you being funny because... Uh, one of my favorite Oscar speeches of all time is when your mom won her third Oscar for Murder on the Orient Express, and she gets yeah. up to the mic, and she's, ha she's thrilled to win it, but then she also says, mm, sometimes Oscar has the wrong timing, and she looks at, she finds Valentina Cortez in the audience, who's up for day for yeah. night, and she says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take this from you, and it's like one of the most like humble, and yet you can tell she, she so appreciates the, the moment, the, 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 the time to speak. She's such a brilliant interviewee anyway. Was humor like a huge part of your life growing up? Because obviously both your parents have, a, have such an austerity about them on the screen. Yes, they do have an austerity on the screen, but they were very funny people, especially my dad, who made very dramatic film. The most famous one are the one that he did right after the Second World War. They were very emotional, heart-wrenching film. And yet father in life was very, very funny. I mean, I remember laughing to the point sometimes I had to leave the room to just catch my breath because he made <laughs> me laugh so much. And mama had a very light, charming sense of humor. Uh, father really, ha, ha, ha. Mama, more of a smile. But yes, both of them uh, uh, were very amusing and fun. And laughter is something I always say when they say, what is your first quality that you're looking in a person? And I always say that it makes me, her or him laugh. <laughs> <laughs> laughter is very important to me. I would say one of my maybe far left um like films that I um, enjoy um, is maybe your first screen appearance uh, and you interact with your mom on the screen um, in uh, Minnelli is a matter of time. And um, I'm just wondering if you look back fondly on that film because it wasn't received well at the time, but you know, it was your first moment on screen with your mother um, and sort of like how you maybe feel about that film years later. Well, you know, I mean, years later now, you know, I lost my parents. Uh, by the time I was 30, I didn't have my father or mother. And uh, I wish I'd had them longer with me. I wish I could work with them and learn more from them. Because what I learned from them, I learned it as a little girl hanging out. But now that I am in the same profession, I have more articulated questions that I can't uh, ask them. Um, that day when my mom asked me, with, with Vincent Minelli asked me to be a, to just play a, a just it was a one day uh, job, mm -hmm. play a nun that my mother's character is dying and I am the nun next to her, uh, that holding her hand as she's dying. And Mama thought it was interesting because Mama and I resemble each other and Vin Minelli and Mama thought that it was interesting that when this woman, she plays an old woman quite confused, she looks up. She sees the nun that is assisting her, but the nun has her face when she was young and was my face. So they liked uh, that moment uh, that might be kind of hallucinatory. So I did it because, of course, it was interesting to be with Mama and Minelli and Liza Minelli was in the film, but also it was extremely intimidating. So once I was on the set, I remember that day being very um, shy, very uh, troubled, <laughs> waiting for the day to be over. Also, I think the producer thought, oh, this could be a nice article. So he invited a lot of paparazzi. And uh, <laughs> so, it, it, you know, you're even more exposed uh, to criticism when you're the daughter of 
they expect you uh, to surprise, to be incredible, and you can never really match the expectations that are so high. So it was a little bit of a torturous day, but looking back, I'm, I really can't believe that I was in a film with Liza Minnelli, directed by Vincent Minnelli and with my mom. <laughs> It's interesting comparing your roles to specifically your mom's because I really think of most of what you do as quote unquote provocative. Like if, if Isabella Rossellini is in a movie like Watch Out, you don't know what you're in for. <laughs> Whereas, you know, your mom has all these famous movies, but she, I would compare her to someone like Greer Garson or something. She's like the leading lady that we're, you know, whose uh, who's, who's regality and charm we're all kind of enamored by. Is there a specific role of your mom's you would have most liked to play? And do you think there's a role of yours she would have played well? I don't know. I never thought. I, I never thought. Uh, I never thought about that. I never thought I would have liked to play my mother. Uh, I was interesting. My mother did a film when she was um, was there actually her last feature film. She did it with the Swedish director Igma Bergman. It was oh, Autumn Sonata. Her. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and mother had a lot of argument with Igma Bergman. It's the story of a woman. Uh, not an actress, but a pianist who has a very big career and neglects her family, neglects her daughter for her career. And uh, um, and years later, uh, you know, I think maybe just 10 years ago, the film was done, not 40, 45 years ago, but about 10 years ago, I was at the Berlin Film Festival and there was an homage to Bergman and they were doing a retrospective of his work, including Autumn Sonata and Liv Ullman, uh, the actress on the film with Mama was there to present the film. And uh, uh, I was asked to join Liv, Liv Ullman on stage to present the film, which I did. I was delighted to see Liv. And Liv <laughs> had uh, such criticism of the film that I was really interested. And I always have a kind of a secret dream of remaking um, Autumn Sonata, but with Liv Ullman directing, because she's also a very good director. She argued that that film, which is a very beautiful, moving film, we all love it, love it really is accusatory of women having a career because Bergman himself, although he had wives that were actresses and um, he did a lot of films with, with them, he had two, two actresses, uh, um, they were his partner. And, uh, and yet when, when they continued their career beyond him, maybe he felt that wasn't right. They should be home. They should take care of the family. What about the children they had together? But he was exonerated from this responsibility. And I thought she had such an interesting point of view. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to do the same film, but with Liv point of view of a more modern woman who defends us? Because the film was done 45 years ago and women were still, um, asking themselves. My mom always said that she doesn't choose acting, acting chose her. It was really a calling. She was only happy if she acted, um, but she felt very guilty. She had four children and she had to often go away and not being with us. And it was a very enormous conflict. And that was 45 years ago. Nowadays, women will have no hesitation in having a career and they would ask the husband to be home and uh, while they were making a film or, or they would ask, uh, uh, people that give them the job. I mean, this is the next requirement to be able to bring children to the set so that at the end of the day with the school, they can be a little bit with their parents. The film not to be always shot in a different continent for three months or so that you don't see your family. I mean, there are things that nowadays we all argue uh, and fight. Um, so that is, uh, yes, I would like to do Autumn Sonata with Liv Ullman directing. And I just want to pop in and say, if people have not seen Autumn Sonata, the movie is amazing. The interplay between Ingrid Bergman and Liv Ullman is second to none. The drama is unbelievably intense and yet so real, too. It's not a melodrama. It is a real drama. So I really encourage people to go see it. Um, I'm interested by what you said about um, your mother saying that, you know, like acting chose her. Um, would you say the same for yourself? I don't, I don't know about acting, but probably telling stories. I, I do prefer mm -hmm. to write and direct and create my shows. I do like to act, but not not all the time. <laughs> it depends with... <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't have the same... Call. I think that I will always do something. In fact, uh, uh, yesterday, my publicist was here in San Francisco, where I am now with my show, Darwin Smile, that I'm going to come to Los Angeles next weekend. 
And she came and I said, I worked very hard this year. And then I said, but at the end of October, I'm going to take two months off to rest. And she said, oh, come on, rest. You never rest. What are you going to do in these two months? So it's true that I, I'm always doing something, something creative, even with my farm. I mean, it doesn't have to be in films. Uh, it can be with the farm. It can be uh, with other things. But I am always finding busy, busy um, narrative, telling stories is what I like. Mm -hmm. A follow up, I think, to that, um, you know, about the acting in your mother, um, you talked about Autumn Sonata, you know, about how Liv, you know, sort of like disagreed with, um, you know, um, Ingmar's sort of feelings about women um, and acting and him being the director. Uh, and your mother was obviously um, married to Rosalini and um, you were married to, you know, two directors who, you know, when people talk about film, they're always talking about David Lynch. They're always talking, talking about Martin Scorsese. Um, did you find that you had a great sort of working relationship um, with them um, while you were married as you were an actress? So I, I, I was married to Marty, but we, nev we never directed me in any film. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead, David, we met uh, doing, during Blue Velvet and we fell in love. Um, the, you know, you were asked me before that my mom did films that were like the great lady lady and my film is like, oh, watch out, what is she doing? I think that my father was a very much of an avant-garde filmmaker. I mean, nowadays we look back at his film and they are classics, but of course uh, he created a new style that uh, critics called neorealism uh, that was very influential for films. Uh, and so this kind of experimental filmmaking and trying different ways of narrative, uh, it's something that I grew up with and maybe is, I expressed it stronger than my mom, although my mom was one of the very few Hollywood actresses who had a full career in Europe. I mean, if you look at my mom, she worked in Sweden, she worked in uh, in Italy, she worked in France, she worked in America. So she had, uh, it wasn't really a regular, predictable Hollywood, uh, fantastically beautiful career, but just in one, in one country. Um, but, uh, so I think that, uh, uh, I don't know, sometimes I'm asked, why do you marry, why did you marry uh, directors? I don't know. First of all, I, I also got married to Jonathan Witherman, who worked for Microsoft, so he was he wasn't a director. <laughs> <laughs> My lovers were not directors, but I think there is also a familiarity and a common interest. Um, I loved what my parents did. I always knew that I was going to remain in films uh, and work in films or theater. And uh, so when I met Marty, there was already uh, a ground of. Uh, common love. I mean, Marty loves films and I love films. So we watched a lot of films together. We talked a lot of films when we still uh, nowadays, when we call each other, we talk about films. And uh, so it was a ground of bonding. Uh I, I mean, we must bring up Death Becomes Her, certainly the film that comes up mm. most among gay men when we discuss uh, Isabella Rossellini. What do you think is the staying power of that movie, which I just want to say in general, I can't compare anything else to it, really. There still is no second Death Becomes Her. Like, it's its its, its own genre, really. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, you know, Robert Zemeckis, who is a fantastically successful director in Hollywood, making most successful commercial film like Roger Rabbit, uh, um, uh, Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump it's uh, you know, he is very experimental. And when I met him, he reminded me very much of my father or David Lynch or Martin Scorsese. He worked with a very small group of uh, friends with whom he went to school at, or college and they invented those special effect. And then once they had the special effect, they wrote the story around it. And it was very mm. artistic. I really knew, I knew and I loved Zemakis. I think he's a marvelous man and we got along very well. Um, and when we did the film, we certainly didn't know that the film was going to be a uh, it became really a film that it is, uh, how you call it, iconic or uh, for, for... Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a person says, oh, I love your work, get, you, that becomes her. I say, oh, the person must be gay. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always wondered about that too, you know, just because I we, we there are so many... Um, 
cult gay films, you know, but, you know, for Robert Zemeckis, you know, making this film, you know, it, it's just, it, it has this fun sensibility in it that you never really see from um, male directors of the time or even now, you know, there's this fun yeah. playfulness in it and just the way that you, um, the women interact in the film, like it feels, it feels freshly original even now. No, it does. It does. I heard that they were going to make a musical for Broadway uh, that becomes, or I don't know what happened to it, it was before COVID. So, uh, yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, but when we were doing the film, we thought it was just going to be a, another fun film uh, for for everybody, from family, for we didn't expect, and it, it is a film for family. I mean, everybody can go see it, but it was particularly impactful uh, with the gay community. Uh, that what we didn't expect. We were surprised by it and delighted <laughs> that we could represent a particular sense of humor, you know, a, that we capture a particular um, irony, irony <laughs> and a fantasy about women and women's relationship of competition and hatred. And wasn't Bruce Willis a marvelous that he oh, yes. played yeah. uh, always kind of the macho, the most beautiful men played this man completely victimized by women, obedient <laughs> women. <laughs> I thought it was uh, extraordinary and fun. Also, how wonderful sense of humor to his own image, how ironic he had been about his own image as this uh, super superhero, super strong, wonderful man uh, of Hollywood to, to make fun of himself and his, uh, and his um, image, his public image. Um, I guess our last question is, it's just so interesting how inventive you are when it comes to um, finding new hyphens to add to your career. I mean, no one would guess that you would become a farmer, that you'd be a scientist, uh, in addition to being all the things you are already. Do you see any other additional occupations you'll be adding to your sort of repertoire as the years go on? Have you, are you bubbling up with, you know, well, uh, you know other I'm, versions of yourself? Well, I am 70, so I don't know how long. Uh, <laughs> that is a, a preoccupation. Not, not only how long I would live, but how long I would be rational. Sometimes I ask, you know, <laughs> because I do these things that are unpredictable. So sometimes I go to my best friends and I say, am I going gaga? Am, am I okay to do it? Or is it the sign of dementia? When I started to be a farmer, a lot of my friends thought, okay, oh, we thought that it was the beginning of uh, <laughs> losing it. But now they like my farm. <laughs> my farm is very uh, rational and very together. It's called Bama Farm and it's fine. But yes, sometimes I I do go to the people and say, can I do it? Or is it the first sign of dementia? <laughs> <laughs> Seeming pretty rad to me, so fear not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much it. for having me. And I, I hope you come see my show. Let me know. Come backstage to see me. Oh, oh, we would love oh, to. We love that. Absolutely. We love yeah. that. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabella. You can catch Jarwin Smile in Los Angeles October 8th and 9th at the Luckman Fine Arts Complex. And we're back with our favorite segment of the episode. It is Keep It. Lewis, what's yours? Well, the internet threw up at us recently, and it involved uh, <laughs> the uh, impresario Lena Dunham. She is currently in the promotional period for her new Amazon film, Catherine Called Birdie. And she tweeted, When I go, I want my casket to be driven through the New York City Pride Parade with a plaque that reads, She wasn't for everyone, but she was for us. Who can arrange? People reacted like she said, I'm the new emperor of America, and you all have no <laughs> rights anymore because I'm your gay god. <laughs> Including... Uh, I'll just read some tweets I've seen. Gonna start living my life with whatever amount of confidence Lena Dunham has that make her think she's an LGBTQ icon. Okay, she's done plenty of great things. Like, Girls Remains an amazing show. There is no second one of Girls. Uh, uh, industry, fabulous. I still think Tiny Furniture is really good. It's like people... Lying about using poppers on Watch What Happens Live. Like, that is gay history. That's, the, that's iconic, right? Now I've said it. Iconic. That's what she is. Uh, there's just something about her in general that has always inspired like 70% too much rage. If it were just, oh, that was annoying. That'd be one thing. But it's, it can never just be she was annoying. It was she, she's the worst of X, Y, and Z. It's like you can't, people can't comment on her without snowballing into furor. Uh, 
And I just want to say that it was a perfectly amusing and slightly zany quote. I don't know. I, I, I just, wh whatever the gene is that make you, makes you want to like fight Lena Dunham, I don't have, and I don't understand it. No one had that energy when, you know, the dwarves walked Snow White in her glass casket through Pride. Right. And, and Millie Bobby Brown then, of course, hit all of them with her car, <laughs> which was funny. We all laughed. Yeah. Um, I saw Millie parked outside of screenings of bros. and Maybe that's why people didn't show up. <laughs> right, because she was driving that engine. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be knocked like right Christine. off that AMC curb. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, if I were Millie Bobby Brown, I would star in a remake of Christine. Oh my god, that would be gays. it. <laughs> it's like how Leah Michelle finally leaned into the illiteracy thing, like she's doing little Instagram bits now. It's like, Millie, come on. Hit yeah. gay people with your car. The internet wants it. Because now the illiteracy jokes are over. Right. Yeah, now we can't do them anymore. Right. Yeah, people are still doing them, but they're not funny. Right. You're, that is really interesting, by the way. It is completely defanged now. There's no reason yeah. to make a joke about that. Yeah. Um, All right, Ira, what is your keep it? My keep it is a double keep it to, oh. um, to two crazy men um, who are like working on rebrands, and I need people to stop giving them oxygen. The first one, Kanye West. Kanye West just did his new show um, in Paris, and like with with Candace Owens in attendance. I saw that. Uh, his I new bestie that. wearing White Lives Matter shirts, and <laughs> oh god! First of all, I've never met a white life that mattered. <laughs> yeah, mattering—that's a specific area of yeah. interest. I don't know about mattering. Okay, the only one who's come close is Jennifer Garner. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> when she hugged Gif Victor Garber that one time and was crying, that did matter. I agree. <laughs> um, yours to me every, once a week. Right. But <laughs> yeah. then I log off, and then what do I yeah. do? Not matter. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, wow. It's just, it's, it's more idiocy that we'd expect from him. But my thing at this point is um, stop going. There's one thing for his annoying fans online to, like, gas him up in Instagram comments when he does something rude, uh, like stalking Kim Kardashian for months um, and turning into um, the Joker, essentially. Right. But um, going to his fashion show, like, that's different than, like, just, like, listening to a song or two when it comes out. Like, you're going to this. You're sitting there while these shirts are being marched out. Get up and leave. And the yeah. thing, too, is that, like, black people have already decided that, like, we're sort of done with them and this trash for, like, a long time. Uh, and sometimes, you know, like, you give him excuses and, you know, you keep giving him an inch and an inch and an inch. But it's like he used to decry not being a part of the fashion industry uh, and worked so hard to get into it because he was knocking down doors for black people. He was really just knocking down doors for himself because uh, there's no black uplift happening. Um, it's the people in the industry who are now propagating this, you know? Like, by giving him attention, giving him press, giving him the oxygen, like, you are part of the problem now. I mean, he, he gave you all the clues to quote that movie, The Snowman. I mean, he's standing there with Candace <laughs> Owens. That's when you can say, oh, enough is enough. This is over. There's nothing here. Shout out to Jaden um, for being there, Jaden Smith, but leaving and tweeting, I did <laughs> Done. And we love and an example. Tweeting, <laughs> tweeting, I don't care who it is. If I don't feel the message, I'm out. And let me just say, that is a spiritual successor to one of my favorite quotes ever. Um, Kim Cattrall's, um, I don't want to be in a situation for even an hour where I'm not enjoying myself. <laughs> <laughs> Which almost sounds like a threat, but I do love that quote. <laughs> Uh, so that's how I feel about that. And the other one is, I don't think we've even talked about him on this show, to be honest, but Christian Walker. Oh, my God. Who, who today is like standing up for his rights and railing against his dad. Anyway, go ahead. Christian Walker, this annoying TikToker who, you know, is like sort of like 
that um, shop HRH girl who's always screaming. Um, and she's kind of funny. Um, but he, the comedy comes from just like him saying like, fuck you liberals and like, fuck you gays. You're doing too much. And it's like almost campy and a parody, but he's used, he's used it to create a brand. And like every time people share his shit, like it just like hate sharing it does well for him. And also like irony sharing it like, oh, he really spilled when he said faggots are too much or whatever. I know. know. And so he's the son of Herschel Walker, um, who somehow has um, more children than Nick Cannon. That's like a Johann Sebastian Bach situation at this point. My God. And they are all like secret children that we've never heard of before. I mean, like. He has more kids than Marlena Evans on Days of Our Lives at this point, okay? <laughs> and, like, Stefano Demira did not hold Herschel Walker on a secret island and have him give birth to children without his knowledge, okay? Well, you don't like, know that for sure, his... but we can guess, yeah, right. <laughs> he is a vile person, you yeah. know? Like, he's, you know, he's um, said so much gross shit in the media. Like, he's also an idiot. Uh, at like, we knew Trump was an idiot. Like, we know Ron DeSantis is an idiot. This is a new level of stupid. Like uh, nothing going on. Yeah, you know, um, there are words I want to say about him. We're in mixed company, so I'm gonna keep it cute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna be like Annie M in uh, Wizard of Oz. You know, there's words I like to call you, but I'm a Christian woman. <laughs> wow didn't know you knew annie m's uh, uh uh virtues so well um but the fact that christian used to support his father and all his like um racist and like um anti-abortion and like just general gross rhetoric and only hypocrisy to, yeah. and hypocrisy only to now be like I supported my father until he lied to our family and like continued to run when we told him not to. And he's going against my morals. And I'm like, girl, you don't have any morals. Shut the fuck no. up. No, it's it's like when Ann Coulter does uh, set, tweets an anti-Trump thing or something. It's like you think I care? You think like you're now you're adding to the conversation by quote unquote coming to your senses? Like, give me a break. Don't let him rebrand. He's dumb. This this just feels like another ploy, to be honest. And like, even if he is fighting with his father, you know, like. Take it to Maury, okay? Like, take it to the Karamo show. I don't know. But, like, <laughs> just, like, I, I have no interest in it. And if you're shocked that your father turned on you, you know, to quote um, the iconic Brandy Marshall in Selling the O.C., one thing about those tables, they turn. Now you've got me thinking about Maury and Connie Chung. <laughs> They were on Watch What Happens one time, and I was like, I never see these people out together. Why aren't they? Why don't, why don't we give them a show on like A&E or something? Do you remember Screen 3? Yes. Uh, Jay and Silent Bob, when they see um, Gail Weathers, it's Connie fucking Chung. Hey, Connie, how's Maury? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we're too distracted by Courtney's um, chopped up bangs. bangs to really process jokes at that point. Yes. Horrific. Horrific. Um... Those are my key pits. I have one more. Oh, there's a third one. Okay, great. Twitter circles. I, uh, get this? I am completely with you. Twitter circles is like a place where like it's basically close friends on Twitter. And a lot of the gays are using it now for, um, you know, just to post nudes. The gays who haven't crossed over in the OnlyFans, they just want some light titillation, you know? Yeah. But, um... My main problem with circles is like people are using it for that and people are also using it to talk shit, which obviously. Right. But stop screenshotting people's Twitter circles. Oh, that's vile. Stop, yeah. stop being a snake. And no one's screenshotting. I'm sure people are screenshotting the nudes and sending them around. But like if someone is dragging someone in a Twitter circle and you screenshot it and you send it to the person who's being dragged, you like – you are it's gutter so unbelievably bald. petty. Are, yeah, you are gutter bald trash. Okay, Dude. like you are so low, I can't even sweep you off the floor. Okay, like it's just it's childish. Snake, it's it's childish. It's snake behavior. Yeah. And then like to and also inserting with, yourself in a conversation. Yeah, yeah, like it's you know you're not in the Kool Aid. You don't know the flavor. Okay, <laughs> like A and B conversation. See your way out of my Twitter circle. Uh, I have, you know, I just think that doing shit like that is like so 
rude. And I also then think like, don't post that online um, and go back and forth about something that was in someone's Twitter circle. I mean, because you weren't supposed to see it in the first place. Can I tell you my problem with Twitter circles? I don't like seeing what I would call other people's grinder messages. Like, like mm. starting conversations and like, and like setting things up. To me, it's a little bit like you're performing. You're, I, I feel gay men in general, well, actually people in general, are a little obsessed with exclusivity. And mm. like to see people like kind of flirting and setting up, I, I don't know, it's sort of like, it's it's like you're saying you're all in cahoots with each other, and then like if you're you're only in some circles and not others, you're like seeing a, a fragment of cahoots. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're seeing like fragments of conversations and realizing you're not in others, and like it seems like people sort of I, I don't know. I, it just fills me with an icky feeling. I agree with that because I like you know not to say bring the mystery back to romance, you know. Yeah. But it's like we're all fagots. We know we're hooking up with each other. Like yeah. you know, like you you know when someone like. Um, who lives in Los Angeles, you know, like goes to DC for the weekend and they take a photo with this one gay. It's like, okay, we, we know they fucked. Right. But yeah. that's, that's the mystery of it. I hate the, like the, someone posts like a nude, right. And then there's the other responses to it on, in the Twitter circles where it's like, Oh, when are we going to meet up or things like that? That's what you mean. Right. Yeah. You know, it's right, like, right. Like, I don't need to see this conversation happening in real time. Take it to the DMs. Yeah. No, right, exactly. Like, why is this public? There's something gross about that particular interaction being public. I can't explain it. Like, maybe, I feel yeah. almost like Neocon saying that. It's just, I, <laughs> I don't mean, like not to, it. A, not to be a prude, you know, like, I love when our friends post news. I love our friends who are right. OnlyFans, you know? But I'm just like, there's certain aspects of it where, like, an OnlyFans is work, you know? Uh, or if you just want to post your shit, like, that's just, like, who you are. But there's, so, there's a next level of performing that just feels like you're doing too much. Like you're performing, yeah. letting everyone know that you're having sex. And it's like, we get it. Yes, yes. It's it, it's like, it, it's not sexy for one thing. But two, I just like Insta close friends better for this reason. It's like, yeah, by all means, post like nudes or whatever and, and post them to whoever you want to see them. But then I don't need to see the next part where you're like, oh, this X, Y, and Z person reached out to me and can you believe it and all that. So, yeah. Uh, all right, that's our show this week. Uh, shout out to Isabella Rossellini for being an icon. We're going to see you backstage. We're going to see you at the farm, girl. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>